Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to fall 2022. Uh, so it's so good to see all of you all, uh, even as you begin this new semester. Uh, let's, let's just begin with a word of prayer. So any one of us can please lead us in prayer. Shri Kumar, if you can lead us in prayer, please. Yes, Master. Okay. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this wonderful gift which you have given to us, Lord. We thank you for this new week which you have given to us. We submit ourselves into your mighty hand. And we pray that, Father God, not by your own understanding, but in your grace and wisdom, you lead us, O oh Father. As we are beginning, Lord Master, this day with your word and with the word with, with your grace, O oh Father. We pray that every word what is we are going to learn and listen from your servant, O oh God, Master. Let it be from the throne room of God, O oh Father. And Father God, we pray that let every precious word what is going to come out from his mouth, let be able to store it in our spirit and in our soul and in our heart, O oh God, Master, so that it can lead us, it can edify us, it can increase our knowledge and wisdom so that we can able to stand strong and bold for the kingdom of God, O oh God, Master, so that we can move ahead, O oh Father. Those words should be from the heaven which will encourage us, heals us, O oh Father, and restore us, O oh Father God. We submit everyone into your mighty hand, Father, Father God, and we pray that prepare each one of our heart, O oh God, and prepare your servant, O oh Father God. Thank you, Father God, for this opportunity to learn, O oh Lord Master, we surrender everything into the hands of the Holy Spirit. And we ask you to lead us and guide us and teach us in Jesus' most holy and matchless name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Shri Kumar. All right. Uh, welcome once again, those who are joining us now. Uh, so excited to begin with this new semester. So this semester, uh, I will be teaching on 1st and 2nd Corinthians, BC 304, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And what we will be doing is throughout the course, we will we will try and complete uh, at least a verse-by-verse -verse study uh, of each uh, chapter from 1st and 2nd Corinthians. So basically, we want to learn, uh, you know, the, both these letters are wonderful letters the Apostle Paul writes. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, beautiful content that uh, is available. And uh, uh, just pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to us even as we learn together. Uh, just before we start, I uh, want to uh, inform us about the grading systems. So uh, we will have, just like last semester, we will have two uh, grading systems. So the first will be a midterm uh, assessment in September. Remember, first week, which will be uh, for 50 marks. And then we will have the final semester, which will be the, uh, in the month of November during the last week, uh, which will again be for 50 marks. And both of them put together uh, will be your final uh, grading uh, marks. All right. So I hope that's all right. Uh, so it's just divided into a midterm, a final assessment, both the marks put together. All right. Uh, so shall we begin with first and second Corinthians? Right. I hope uh, you have uh, downloaded the notes as well. The PDF is available on the stream, so feel free to download it and track along even as we uh, you know, go through the entire course. All right, so let's begin with the introduction. Right? Now, one of the things that we learned uh, you know, uh, while we study the Bible is always look at the background, right? Who are the people? What is the region, or or what kind of uh, what is the audience? What what is the place? What is uh, the the cultural setting, uh, the demographic setting of a place? So when we do that, we will be able to you know really uh, uh, study the Bible in the right way, right? So let's look at a background of Corinth, right now. Uh, uh, just just to let us know that Paul went into Corinth during his second missionary journey, right? Uh, I think we did a part of it in, uh, uh, you know, in a couple of lessons last semester as well. How he went into uh, Asia Minor, he went into those, uh, uh, you know, the agora, the marketplace. He began to preach the gospel there, and how many lives were touched. Uh, so, second missionary journey, Paul goes into uh, Corinth. Now, the city of Corinth. 
was established in a colony, right? Uh, like veterans, uh, namely Julius Caesar, uh, uh, and they all used to live there. And it became a Roman province, right? Uh, in early 27 BC. And over the years, it underwent uh, construction, rebuilding, reconstruction. Uh, a lot of structures that were there in Corinth uh, were probably either rebuilt or re demolished uh, by the Roman emperor. So uh, there could have been, you know, uh, changes made in the structures. Now, Corinth was noted for a place of luxury. It had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people visiting Corinth. It was a harbor, a lot of uh, business. Uh, and people would, you know, during those days, people would come there uh, on, on vacations. Uh, you know, uh, Romans, Roman citizens, people from different parts of the country would come uh, to spend time there because it was a place of luxury. It was a commercial space. Uh, and one thing we do know that it was a place of intense immorality. There was immorality everywhere, right? Uh, you know, they also had the saying that, uh, you know, uh, when when they refer to people to a girl or a woman as a Corinthian, it only meant that she's a prostitute, right? Uh, there were good sides. There were good things about Corinth, but most of them were sinful, right? They were, you know. You know well, considered a good city because of the development they had made to uh, uh, to the place that they are staying in. Uh, but but then we see that immorality was always on the rise there. And during this time, we know that there was there were there were two goddesses, goddess Apollo and goddess Aphrodite, right? Uh, now let's look at what they are. What are these uh, these two, right? Apollo was a Greek god associated with you know the sun, the light, knowledge, uh, medicine, music, poetry, uh, and and this temple of Apollo was in the lower part of Corinth, right? And it had about you know thirty nine columns. It had uh, of which seven were. Uh, seven are still standing today, right? Uh, so if you have seen pictures of Corinth and you would have seen those pillars, uh, maybe if you go to uh, Google, you can see them. Uh, that is the that is the temple of Apollo, right? And uh, the other goddess was goddess Aphrodite. Now this was a Greek goddess of love. The goddess Aphrodite was was uh, in a part of a city called Acro. Let me get that right. Uh, Acro Corinth, and about 1,800 feet high. Now, since this was a goddess of love, it was. It is said that there were people who, you know, even if they committed sexual immorality, right? Even if people were married, uh, and they would indulge in sexual immorality outside of marriage, it was all right. It was accepted. Why? Because it was like as if they were following goddess Aphrodite, right? And this 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 go, this temple of Aphrodite had one thousand male and female prostitutes, right? Now, let's keep this in the background, right? Picture this: you got a place, Corinth, a booming sector, luxurious place. You got the rich and the wealthy staying there. You've got a harbor. It's it's known as the ornament of Greece, meaning that's the, like the center of Greece. And and then you got, uh, you know, the uh, in the lower parts you got a uh, temple of Apollo. And then you got in uh, Acro Corinth you got a temple of Aphrodite. So there's idol worship, there's sexual immorality, there is prostitution. Uh, and there is no sign of God, no sign of the Holy Spirit, nothing 
no work at all right and paul the apostle goes into this place in the second missionary journey right now in first corinthians many of the believers in the corinthian corinthian church paul is already talking to them and he's telling them you know what there's a lot of worldliness there's a lot of things that is around you uh, there's sexual sin, there's sexual immorality, uh, the, the, the people are falling into all kinds of, uh, you know, lustful sins. But you as a church are to impact the city, right? Uh, and he begins that whole letter trying to firstly thank God and then, uh, you know, also bring correction. So, so remember that where the Apostle Paul is going, it's not like there were already a church or you know people were very receptive to him and people you know they just accepted the gospel that's far from the truth right there's a in in Corinth there's a place called the agora which is the marketplace now uh just a little bit of a background um uh, paul is in uh, in in Corinth and there he meets aquila and priscilla right uh, so AD 49 Paul visits Corinth, spends 18 months in Corinth, right? So the, high, the most number of years he stayed was in Ephesus, which was three years. But after that, it was Corinth, right? 18 months in Corinth. Now, what was he doing there, right? Uh, he, he, was tent, he, was, he was a tent maker, so he began to work, right? He went to the marketplace. Now, remember, it's a, Corinth was a place of business. So you have the Agora. And probably Paul, you know, had his own stall or his own shop there. And he, he was, you know, doing tent making, right? And it also we also see in the book of Acts, it says that uh, he went to the marketplace and he was ministering to the Jews and the Gentiles, right? Now, while he was ministering, he met this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. They were Jewish couples. They were a Jewish couple. Now, what were they doing in Corinth? The Roman Emperor Claudius uh, ordered that all Jews from were supposed to leave. Uh, all Jews from Rome were supposed to leave and go to another place, right? So they were ordered to leave. So that's why Aquila and Priscilla chose to come to Corinth, right? And so now we got three people, right? You've got Paul. Got the couple Aquila and Priscilla, and of course the Apostle Paul may have, uh, you know, uh, shared the gospel with Aquila and Priscilla, and you know, uh, invited them to accept Jesus, and they would have readily uh, accepted. But they began to work together as a team, right? Uh, now it is during this time, during this eighteen months, where Apostle Paul was working as a tent maker. That he received help from the Philippian church. Now, uh, maybe it's a little confusing, but uh, uh, but just remember these you know important uh, nuggets of uh, information, right? So, eighteen months he's in Corinth. Aquila Priscilla are there. They three are working in the marketplace as tent makers. Uh, and now you got the Philippian church who he visited just before this. They are supporting Paul by sending uh, money or sending gifts to Paul, right? Later on, what happens is during the second missionary journey, Silas and Timothy arrive from Macedonia, right? Uh, well, Silas and Timothy arrive from Macedonia, and they join Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla. So now you got the three who were Apostle Paul, Aquila, Priscilla, and then Silas and Timothy joins in. So you got five people there. And then later on, we see that even Luke comes there. So you got a team of six people right now in Corinth. Now it's so wonderful to see the work of the Holy Spirit, right? How the Lord just connected with people and brought people to Paul because the Lord knew that you know this place 
needs to hear the gospel. This place needs to, there needs to be a change. And so wonderfully, there, now there are six people proclaiming, ministering to uh, people in Corbett. Right? I hope you're uh, tracking along, right? Now, Paul began to proclaim the gospel in, in, in the marketplace, uh, outside of uh, homes, outside of peoples, outside of the temples. And many of the God-fearing Jews, they accepted the gospel. And so did many Gentiles, right? And so some of the people who are saved is mentioned there, you know, Justice, Crispus, Stephanus, Sostinus, Erastus. You know, while I was preparing this, I was so, you know, I was so moved because Paul is just mentioning it so, you know, it is so natural to him. He's saying, these are the people who got saved when we ministered to them. Now remember the background. These are people who are living in sexual immorality. There is there is all kinds of things that are happening in Corinth. You see the power of the Holy Spirit is touching these people's lives. Right? They probably have never heard of Jesus. Maybe they you know so many of them are Gentiles on this list. They don't know who Jesus is. Or probably they would have heard of a man named Jesus who was crucified, or they didn't even hear about him. But you see how Paul and his team were able to touch lives, right? And while at Corinth during those 18 months, Paul heard about the Thessalonian church, right? Uh, because prior to this, he was also in Thessalonica, and he heard and they planted a good church there. But what did he hear about the church in Thessalon uh, Thessalonica? They, they were scared. They saying, you know, what if Jesus has already come and gone? And so Paul hears that report. He says, okay, let me write to them. And, then, and when we read first and second Thessalonians, we see that he is encouraging them. And he's telling the church, you know, when, you know, when the rapture happens, this is what is going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, but you be aware there's godlessness. There are people who are, uh, you know, pretending to be God and pretending to be the Messiah. So he writes first and second uh, Thessalonians there. Yes, Mangi, please go ahead. Mangi, uh, thank you, sir. Yes. yes. Okay. I just want to, to ask um, Priscilla and Aquila. Yes. Were, were they in Corinth on Paul's second uh, visit, or was it just the first visit when he first came went there? Yes. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mangi. Uh, so, what happened was, the Roman emperor. There was a Roman emperor Claudius. He ordered the Jews to go uh, to leave Rome. So, Aquila and Priscilla leave Rome and go to Corinth. Right now, in Corinth, it was during that time Paul has come in for his second missionary journey. So, they're meeting for the first time there. Right, uh, and and if we see later on also. Uh, Paul, you know, uh, Paul leaves Aquila and Priscilla uh, at Corinth, right? So it's they're meeting for the first time. Uh, it's just God appointed, right? Uh, and the and even more interesting is both of them had the same profession, right? Tent makers. So Aquila and Priscilla were tent makers. Paul was also a tent maker. So probably, right? I'm just I'm just uh, you know uh, imagining this whole. Uh, you know the whole picture of what would have happened probably paul is there now in paul's mind i need to reach out i need to do something here so which is the best place to go go to the marketplace you have hundreds of thousands of people coming there so he would have gone probably to the marketplace and you know began to sell his tents or, or you know uh, doing his business there and he would have probably seen Aquila and priscilla he said hey you're not jews yeah and you've got that common ground. Remember lifestyle evangelism? We spoke about it all as well. How wonderfully Paul, you know, he ministered to the people there. So both were tent makers. So they probably found common ground. And Paul would have told them, hey, you know, uh, the Messiah we are talking about, this is what it was Jesus. And he would have shared the whole gospel. And they became a team. 
and the and when you read on in the book of acts it shows that they they were there together right paul considered them as leaders so it was not like you know uh, paul chose aquila and priscilla and told them no you do this only uh, only what i tell you to do no they were leaders in many places he says my my fellow brethren he says my fellow brother brothers in christ uh, aquila and priscilla uh, so it was the first time that they met uh, but there was this you know wonderful bonding that happened immediately we'll see uh, even as we go down we will see what happens to paul and uh, sorry paul what happens to aquila and priscilla as well right so remember the team was six right so all six are there ministering together uh, mangi i hope that answers your question yes pastor thank yes. you all right all right so, welcome oh, if i may ask again so yes. what happened in, in in his first visit to corinth did he march to establish a, a church or a community or only in his second visit when the church was birth thank you yes so uh, what happens is uh, mangi during the first visit itself the people uh, who accepted the gospel we, we saw a list of people right uh, justus crispus stephanus ostinus uh, they formed the church right so in the first visit itself most of the places where apostle paul went when there were believers it was mostly a house church right now we must remember, we must understand that you know it's not like what we have now right okay believers get together if to start a church you have to have those legal things you open a trust you open up uh, all these things you need to get uh, uh, permission from the police so all that was not there so they became believers they gathered together in houses probably every week once or twice and that was the church right so it was the first uh, visit itself even galatia if you see uh, the churches of galatia they were formed immediately prior to this Uh, prior to Corinth, he was at uh, Thessalonica and he was at Philippi. The the church has already uh, begun there, and they are already sending gifts to Paul, right? So it was the first. Uh, the moment believers began, Paul knew, okay, because they they needed to be that community, right? So let's get together, and that was the church, right? Right. So during this ministry around Corinth. Paul also evangelized in neighboring towns and cities, right? So there was Centuria, there's Achaia, uh, and remember in Achaia, the the woman named Phoebe, who was a, uh, uh, you know, a, a rich lady, a purple merchant. Oh no, that was Lydia. But Phoebe was uh, also there. She was also a rich woman, and and many lives were touched there as well, right? Now, Paul. was here for 18 months towards the end of 18 months paul said okay now the church is planted they've got some leaders i need to go to jerusalem right uh, and so he cuts off his hair because he takes a vow he says i'm going to go back to jerusalem and take part in the feast now why does he do this It was because you know people started to uh, complain and say paul is only you know ministering to the gentiles and uh, he's talking only about all these you know the holy spirit about jesus and he's gone away from the law right so paul wanted to show them hey it's not that i've gone away from the law i'm fulfilling the law so he he wanted to show the people the leaders as well that he still obeys all of this right but god uh, the, the what the lord jesus did was more important than the law Right. So he he goes, uh, he cuts his hair, and he's getting ready to go back to Jerusalem. So, from Centuria, that is where he was ministering near Corinth, a town near Corinth, he went to Ephesus. Now, here's where now the team was six, right? In Ephesus, Paul leaves Aquila and Priscilla there, and he says, Aquila, Priscilla. I've been with you for probably eighteen months now. We've worked together. We've done ministry together. We've planted a church together. We've raised up leaders together. Now it's time to move on. I need to move on. But you stay back in the church in Ephesus. 
So as a couple, they stay back there. They're in Ephesus. And Apostle Paul goes on to Jerusalem. Right? Now, here's something interesting that happened in Ephesus. And we read that in, uh, in the book of Acts as well, right? Where this wonderful man named Apollos comes into the picture. Remember, Paul is writing to the letter in uh, Corinthians. He says, is Christ divided? Yeah. He says, uh, who was uh, crucified? Was it uh, Cephas? Was it Apollos? So it's interesting to see that the Apostle Paul mentions Apollos' name. Because he becomes a great leader. Right? So who is this Apollos? Now, Apollos was from Alexandria, Egypt. And he comes to Ephesus. Right? Now, he's a, he was a good man. An honorable man uh, uh, and and he was preaching he was an eloquent preacher gifted orator so what he was doing was he was preaching on John's baptism right he started preaching you know you all have to get water baptized because once you get water baptized that you will be forgive uh, you'll find forgiveness of sins that is the message of John the Baptist now, Apollos heard this. Uh, sorry, uh, Aquila and Priscilla heard him. Said, okay, Apollos, come. What you're preaching is good. It's right. But let me keep you updated. After John the Baptist came, the Lord Jesus. He was the Messiah. He died on the cross. He rose again from the dead. And now he baptizes us with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Share the gospel. Apollos, brilliant man. He knew the law, he knew everything, accepted the gospel. And now, Aquila and Priscilla tell Apollos, you go back to Corinth. We've got some leaders there. We've started a church there, right? Uh, we've got some leaders there. Sostinus is a leader there. He was a chief ruler uh, of, the, of the Jews. He's also there. Go back to Corinth. And lead the church there. You see how wonderfully everything just comes into place. It's like God is taking people from different places, different areas, putting the whole puzzle together. Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla, shares the gospel with them. Aquila and Priscilla become wonderful leaders. They come on to Ephesus. They're leading the church in Ephesus. Meet this man named Apollos. Apollos is wonderfully a, a great man, a great orator. They share the gospel with Apollos, and Aquila and Priscilla says, Go to Corinth, the church that we were in, we started together. Go there and look after the believers. And he goes there. And I'm sure when he went to Corinth, he would have done a great work there. And that is why Paul mentions him as a leader. He mentions him with between Peter himself and says and mentions Apollos' name. Right? So that is the end of the second missionary missionary journey. Quickly we'll go to the third missionary journey. Look at what happens in the church of Corinth. Then we'll begin with chapter one. Right? So Paul spends three years in Ephesus. Right? He uh, three years in Ephesus. There he wrote first uh, he wrote Galatians, and then in Ephesus, during those three years, he writes First Corinthians. Now, basically, what happens is Apollos is is in church. He's leading the people in Corinth, and he's seeing what's happening. So, uh, all these things are happening. So probably he sends a letter. Right, he sends a letter saying these are the things that are happening. There is division. Uh, I, it's a good church, it's a spiritual church, wonderful people, uh, but there's no order. There's chaos. There's division. There's strife. There's uh, pride, uh, and it's hard. Right, uh, and so Paul hears about this, and he says, "Okay, I need to sit and write to the Corinthian church." So he writes 1 Corinthians. Right? 
he says he's in Ephesus right now. So he begins to write for Spirit. Okay, I heard about these problems in the church. Division and this, this is the there's a whole list of problems. So Paul is writing in response to those problems. That's what First Corinthians is. And while at Ephesus, he also receives uh, you know information from Galatians. What what is that one? There he in Galatia they're saying no no need uh, no need all of this we'll go back to the law. So Paul is furious. In his first missionary journey, he went to Galatia. He planted those churches. They are saying, no, we'll go back to the law. And so he writes there, Galatians, why, why? You people of Galatia, why are you doing this? You are saved by grace through faith. And he writes the whole letter of Galatians as well. Now, you just think about the Apostle Paul. He's in Ephesus. Again, a, a, a place full of idol worship and uh, you know, uh, sexual immorality. He's planted a church there, but things are not going right. He's being beaten. He's been he's been uh, almost killed. There's a death threat on him. Everything is going wrong for him. And on top of that, additional to that, he's getting these letters saying, "Oh, Galatia, uh, people are going back to the law, uh, and here Corinth, uh, people are you know there's division. They're doing whatever they want to do." Now. What would you and I do? And sometimes we may feel, God, how do I make these people understand? Hey, why are these people doing this? Where did I go wrong? Right? But we don't see that in Paul. What a wonderful leader. We see the heart of restoration in the Apostle Paul. What does he do? He chooses one of his best men, Titus. He says, okay, Titus, you go to Corinth. And look after the people there. There's Apollos there. Join with him. Take this letter. Make them, you know, read it and make them understand this. So Titus goes with the letter to Corinth uh, to, you know, and to help out Apollos. Now, what did Apostle Paul do from Ephesus? He gets the Macedonian call. So he goes into Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, Thessalonica Beria. And while in Macedonia, he writes uh, uh, Second Corinthians, right? So again, another letter where again he's trying to bring correction, but he's also exhorting the church. Uh, so he's right now in Macedonia, ministering to people. Macedonia was where Paul received the most amount of persecution. They wanted to kill him. He was beaten. He was bruised. Uh, he was put into prison, uh, and people ridiculed him, mocked him. Uh, but he stays on there in Macedonia, and he writes Second Corinthians. Uh, Titus arrives at uh, Macedonia, uh, so Titus is in was in Corinth. He stays there for some time. He finds out where Paul is. Paul is in Macedonia. He comes, and you know when when Titus comes, his heart is rejoiced. His heart is, you know, uh, uh, in the book of Acts, it says that he was rejoicing in his heart. He was so pleased to see his brother in Christ. And uh, then Paul writes, you know, Titus probably came back with, you know, their questions or their uh, thoughts from the Corinthian church. And Paul writes the second letter of Corinthians. And that comes to an end of the third missionary journey as well. So with this in the background, right? Uh, let's go to chapter one, right? So it's always it's always good to keep these things in the back of our mind, right? Uh, it's not as it's not a easy place. Now we must also remember Paul is well advanced in years, right? He started his missionary journey probably when he was around fifty years old. Now he's probably about, you know, uh, uh, maybe sixty early, maybe uh, sixty-two, sixty-three, about twelve years down. So he's old. Now we must remember that he was—he has gone through so much of difficulties. Each and every missionary journey was a physical, mental strain upon him. He was put into prison, beaten, bruised, 
So mentally, physically, he was weak as well, right? So let's look at chapter one. Paul begins chapter one with his with this amazing salutation. Uh, I'll just read that. So yes, chapter one. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sostenus, our brother. Remember Sostenus? He was a chief ruler, right? So now probably he's become a leader in the church, right? Uh, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Right? So verse 1 and 2 is Paul's customary greeting. Now, the church in Corinth is about seven years old during this time uh, when Paul is writing 1 Corinthians. Seven years old. So I'm sure there were a lot of believers added into the church, and I'm sure there would have been, uh, as, as there are many people, there would have been also many problems. right? Uh, but the wonderful thing is that the work of the Holy Spirit did not stop. You see the grace of God there. Sometimes, you know, when we are doing wrong things, when we may not be in line with God's word, yet the Holy Spirit, you know, God is favorable to us. He shows His grace upon us. And he continues to pour out His Spirit upon us. And we see the best example here. Right? There was division, there was, there was you know, uh, chaos in the church, yet people were flowing the gifts, prophecies, word of knowledge, and all of that. Right? So he starts off by saying, Paul called to be an apostle. The word Call the Greek word means kletos, which is invited or appointed. Right? Uh, you and I are the ones who are appointed to be an ambassador, a messenger of Christ. Right? So our calling is because of the will of God. Right? It is God's calling upon our life. We don't get to choose. Right? And so that's so that's so encouraging, right? The moment we are fulfilling what God wants us to do, we are fulfilling the will of God. Now, it does not need to be only ministry. Some of us may be in business or in work or homemakers. The moment we are doing what God has called us to do, we are fulfilling God's ministry. Right? Sostenus uh, in Acts 18 was the chief ruler of the synagogue, and he becomes part of Paul's pastoral team here in the second missionary journey right and he goes on to say that to the church of god which is at corinth to those who are sanctified right? i like that word sanctified the word as as a church you and i are sanctified the word sanctified means to be set apart to be holy uh, in god's eyes and we know this right uh, imagine paul is now we must, you know, sometimes we use these words and it it becomes just fancy jargons that we use, right? Hey, I'm sanctified, I'm justified. But picture the background that Paul is to the people who he's writing to. See the background of the people, we just studied it. And Paul is saying, hey, you are not like the others. You may be just few in numbers, but you are called. You are set apart. You are appointed. You are holy. You are consecrated for Christ. So they may be majority outside, but you are greater than them. You are called to impact them. He's saying you are sanctified. Uh, uh, Corinth was known as a sin city, but the church was to influence the city of Corinth. And eventually it did. The reason that we are talking about Corinth even right now is because the church has impacted the city of Corinth. Paul's letter has impacted the city of Corinth. Right? Imagine, so many years later, we are talking about a city in Corinth where maybe many of us have never even gone there. Right? It is because the church is greater than the people there. Nobody is talking about goddess Apollo, 
nobody is talking about goddess Aphrodite. Right? You have to go to Google to search about them. But every know, everyone know about Jesus. Everyone know about the church. Right? We are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Uh, and let's go to verse 3. Right? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Grace, the Greek word is charis. Uh, it's an encompassing word again. Divine favor, divine empowerment. Uh, divine virtues, divine gifts, right? grace, unmerited favor. So you see the blessing that Paul is pronouncing on his people here. And it says grace and peace. Greek word is called Irene, uh, refers to tranquility, harmony, safety. Right? And uh, many uh, later on in Timothy, he says, May the God of peace be with you. He also says, May the God of peace. Uh, crush the work of the devil underneath your feet. Right? As believers, grace and peace is from God and it's ours. We can walk in it. Right? We can walk in God's grace. We can walk in God's peace. Are there going to be storms? Are there going to be challenges? Difficulties? Definitely yes. Remember, Paul is writing this letter beaten, bruised, many years later, mentally, physically stressed. But he says, grace and peace to you. Right? Uh, what about the church in Philippi? He says, rejoice in the Lord always. He's sitting in prison. He's saying, rejoice in the Lord. Right? So grace and peace is ours. And it's from God. And we can walk in this. Let's go to verse 4. I love this verse. I thank God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge. Verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you. Now it's interesting to see this, right? And it's a very, very important lesson that we must learn as leaders. Why is Paul writing this letter? He is writing this letter because he's going to bring correction on the people. Right? Probably Apollos has said, you know, these people, you know, there's division. They, they don't know how to, they have the gifts of the Spirit. They're not using it rightly. They're having communion, the Lord's table. One is eating here. One is doing something else there. And maybe Paul was furious listening to all of this. He must have got angry. Why is this happening? But see how wonderfully Paul starts off. He says, I thank God always concerning you. We see that later on in the episode, he, he brings up all the points, right? all the things that need to be corrected. Paul brings it up. But he begins by saying, I thank God for you. An important life lesson for us recognize what God has done for us, right? See the good things and give thanks. You know, it's very easy for us to, you know, when we want to bring correction or we want to, uh, you know, correct, uh, it could be even correcting our children, right? Sometimes, uh, sometimes we may just say, hey, don't do it this way. Or, you know, you were supposed to do it this way, but you didn't do it like this. And, and we may end up maybe you know, hurting the child or hurting a friend or family member. But here's a very important lesson. Yes, Paul doesn't stop correcting, bringing correction. But he starts off by thanking God. Right? So we can be thankful for people, for situations that come our way. Right? Maybe some of us are going through a difficult season. Say, God, I want to thank you. For the previous seasons that you are always there with me, you have been faithful. I remember the times when you know I was broken and you restored me. And I know that you will continue to be with me in the season that I'm going through now. It makes such a big difference, right? But imagine we're going through a season of difficulty and we say, God, not again. You know, last time also I went through the same season. Now you're taking me through a different season and this looks worse than the other one. 
you know it, it, it it's not a right attitude to carry give thanks give thanks for what he has done what he has given us right and then yes as leaders as people who may be leading people leading ministries leading teams in a workplace we have to bring correction right the lord jesus himself did that but uh, this is a you know good attitude to have to first you know recognize the good things god has done thank god for it and then address challenges that come our way right uh, let's read the next verse for the grace of god which was given to you by christ jesus right now we must understand this there's a general grace of god which is available to all believers and then there's a special grace of god which god gives to us to fulfill our assignment in life right now let me give you this example we pray say god forgive me of my sins uh, make me a new person we receive the grace of god we receive forgiveness we walk in the general grace of god god's grace upon our lives but the special grace of god is say god I want to be this businessman. I need to start my own business, or I want to be. Oh, uh, I want to start my own school, or I want to start my own uh, company, or I want to start my own ministry. I need your grace. That is a special endowment of grace that God will put upon us, right? where people will get connected, people will, you know, capture our vision. God's grace will be upon our lives. When we go speak to people, we'll find a special grace upon our lives. And so here, there is a special grace over the church community of believers in, in Corinth. Paul recognizes this special grace and acknowledges the special grace in this church. And I would I believe that the special grace is, you know. The whole aspect of being able to flow in the gifts of the spirit right they are you know people who are still yet to understand many things right yeah, paul writes to them are you still babies are you still infants no it's been seven years you can't be drinking milk you need to be eating solid food but i see that you are still immature Yet, by God's grace, the gifts of the Spirit is working. The work of the Holy Spirit is going on increasing, probably to bring many lives to Christ. Right? It's not like the Corinthian church did everything wrong. No. I'm sure they would have, you know, there were good leaders who were going out, reaching out, ministering to people, right? They needed this whole guidance on how to you know, manage a church. Now we have several tools available right, on leadership and how to make teams and all these things. We have several tools. They don't know. They don't even know the concept of church. Right? So, so maybe you know that special grace was there because you know God was just beginning to work in their lives. Uh, and beginning to do a work in the city of Corinth. And, and that special grace had to be there, especially for a city like Corinth, right? Because otherwise, uh, things of the world, of things of outside of the church would have come into the church and, you know, really caused the damage. Uh, but we thank God for his special grace, right? Uh, last, okay, it's 9.50. Let's take a break. We'll come back. We'll continue with verse 5. Right. Uh, any questions uh, up to now? Any questions? I hope I was not too fast. Uh, hope you were able to track along. But please feel free to stop me and ask questions if you have any. Uh, any questions? Okay, nothing as of now. If you do remember, yes, uh, Shri Kumar, can we probably take your question after we come back after the ten minutes yes. break? Yes, Pastor. Okay, thank you thank so much. You. Let, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 10 o'clock. 10